Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Nanod Pranam, all those to Srila Prabhupada and Guru Maharaj. Thank you for joining Prabhuji. Um, uh, devotees today, uh, Guru Maharaj will not be able to join the uh, call. Uh, that's why we requested um, His Grace Buddha Bhavana Prabhu to give the class today for all of us. Um, Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Nanod Pranam, all those to Srila Prabhupada and Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much for joining and giving your time and association to us this morning, Prabhuji. Um, of course, it's your afternoon. Um, will you please take over the call, Prabhuji? I'll just share the screen and the verse you mentioned to me. Okay. Can I actually change the verse slightly? Yeah, sure. So if we can make it um, 2, 10, 1, please. Okay. Thank you. 10, 1. Yes, correct. <laughs> Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakambatamscha. Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Chikat Pate. Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate. Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavanishri. Rishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchika Patrubhyas Cha. Rika Sindhu Vyevacha. Patidnam Bhavanivyo Vaishna Vyo Namo Namaha. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasudhi Gaurabhata Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So, um, yeah, so whatever we do for this class, and also, um, Levanya Mataji, just a, just a quick comment that I will, unfortunately, to leave at 4.45. I hope that's okay. I can give the yeah. class and have time for questions. Yeah, okay. Sure, so sure. This, okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. So this thank verse is a, is a very interesting verse from the Bhagavatam because this verse actually explains the 10 topics of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So I thought we could read this, read the translation, and then we can discuss something on this particular verse. So I'll just read it and then we go from there. Sri Shukur Vacha, Atrasaga Visagas Chastanam Poshnam Utaya, Mamvantai Shanukata Nirodo Muktiya Ashraya. Okay, Sri Shukur um, Uvacha, Sri Shukur Dev Goswami said, Atra in the Shri, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Sagaha, statement of the creation of the universe. This Sagaha, statement of subcreation. Cha also, Stanam, the planetary systems, Poshanam, protection. Uttayaha, the creative impetus, Manvantara, changes of Manus, Ishanukata, the science of God, Nirodaha, going back home, back to Godhead, Muktihi, liberation, Ashrayaha, the Sanam Bonam. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. Sri Shukadev Goswami said in the Srimad Bhagavatam, there are 10 divisions of statements regarding the following. The creation of the universe, sub-creation, planetary systems, protection by the Lord, the creative impetus, the change of Manus, the science of God, returning home back to Godhead, liberation, and the summon bonum. Okay, so I will um, I'll just say something about this, this very special verse, and then we can open up for some questions. So, so it is really the, the science of Krishna consciousness as given to us by Srila Prabhupada has so many fine points and so much deep levels of understanding 
one of the most important and powerful things about the teachings is that they are coherent. That means that throughout the teachings, throughout the system of the teachings, you will find that one thing can relate to something else that can relate to something else that can relate to something else. And so it's like a great tapestry or you could say like a great jigsaw puzzle, that one piece of the puzzle, you'll see how it fits with something else. And you'll see how that fits with some other subject and that fits within a different topic. And altogether, there's a saying that people have sometimes that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. In the case of the Srimad Bhagavatam, because we know it is non-different from Krishna, it is Grant Avatar, it is a literary incarnation of Krishna. Therefore, the Srimad Bhagavatam actually has unlimited meaning. And the Srimad Bhagavatam will give unlimited understanding and realization to devotees depending on the um, sincerity of the devotee and the Lord's um, reciprocation based upon that sincerity. One of the things that I've been finding to be extraordinarily powerful is the ability to understand the Srimad Bhagavatam by understanding some of the overarching principles, frameworks or categories that are within the Srimad Bhagavatam. And so what I thought we'd do is go through some of the understanding here. Um, so these 10 topics of Srimad Bhagavatam are present throughout all the 12 cantos. We know that the Srimad Bhagavatam is considered to be the Lord's body. And we know that within that um, Bhagavatam, in, in, within the cantos, we know that the 10th canto is the Lord's smiling face. The um, 11th canto is his forehead. The 12th canto is his entire head. Right? So we know that different parts of the body are also related to different parts of the Lord's, um, different parts of the Lord's body, Krishna's body, are related to different cantos of the Bhagavatam. There's also another way of looking at the Bhagavatam, and um, this is called the Krama theory. And so Vishnath Chakravali Thakur, he explains how different topics from the 10 divisions of the Bhagavatam relate to different cantos. Uh, now, there's also, interestingly enough, a different explanation given by Jiva Goswami. Right? So he says that all the different topics, all the different 10 topics of the Bhagavatam are present in all the cantos. So there's no contradiction. These different acharyas are explaining the Bhagavatam in different ways, according to their different realizations. But um, yeah, Jiva, sorry, Vishnath Chakravali Thakur uses what is called the Krama theory. And so I'll just explain what that means. But I'll begin by explaining that the first canto of Bhagavatam, um, it gives the methodology by which one can understand the Bhagavatam. So we, we hear in the beginning of the Bhagavatam how the Bhagavatam has been passed down. So Krishna gives the teachings of the Bhagavatam to Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma get, passes those teachings on to Narada Muni. Narada Muni gives those teachings to Vyasadev. Vyasadev explains those teachings to his son, Shukadev Goswami. Shukadev Goswami speaks the Bhagavatam to Pariksit Maharaj. And in the conversation between Shukadev Goswami and Maharaj Pariksit, we know that Sutta Goswami is in the audience of those assembled to hear that conversation because the sages come to hear that dialogue. And then later Sutta Goswami will explain what he heard in that conversation to the sages of Nemisharanya. So this, um, this methodology of how to study the Bhagavatam, how to understand the Bhagavatam, is to understand it in a submissive mood, hearing from a qualified person or qualified persons. 
um, specifically two terms are given, Shushruta and Kriti Bihir. So Shushruta means to hear with humility and to hear with humility, it actually means to hear with respect from the person who is sharing the Bhagavatam. So that's Shushruta. Kriti Bihir means to listen attentively, great eagerness to hear. So we, we see or we understand from the first canto that these different personalities who have heard, heard the Bhagavatam, they've heard it with that mood. They've heard it with great respect for the speaker and great eagerness to hear. And because they had the proper mood, the proper receptivity, the proper respect, and they were hearing from a qualified person, the meaning of the Bhagavatam was understood by them and has entered into their hearts. Yeah. They have understood the Bhagavatam and, or the essence of the teachings because it's unlimited. There's always more and more that can be understood. And then they have been able to pass that understanding onto others. So the first canto is giving that methodology the methodology by which the Bhagavatam can be understood. Oftentimes we think it's about the speaker, but actually what is within our power is our sincerity of desire to hear that Bhagavatam. So that's first canto. The second canto is what is called Sadhana Tattva. So, um, well, it's, a, yeah, it's about Sadhana. So in the, in the second canto, um, Shukadev Goswami, he's speaking about many different types of sadhana, but he will really go on to explain that the bhakti yoga, the sadhana of hearing about Krishna, that is the highest of all the different sadhanas. And then from the third canto onwards, we have these 10 topics of Bhagavatam. So canto three is saga, the primary creation. Canto four is visaga the secondary creation. Canto five is stanam. Stanam, is, so here it says the planetary systems. So in the fifth canto Bhagavatam, you'll hear about the different planetary systems, the hellish planets, etc. Stanam also means the structure of the universe. And so in the fifth canto, it's really about helping us to understand how the universe is structured. And it's to help us to understand actually our position uh, right? it's help is to help us to understand our position in the universe where what is our position so for example um stanham also relates to um this idea of being well situated so that you can understand the supreme lord okay so saga this saga stanham so that's the fifth canto Sixth canto is potionum. Um, so here Prabhupada says protection. So it's really important when we read the Bhagavatam to understand how the Lord has protected his devotees. And when we understand how the Lord has protected his devotees, it will help us to understand that we will be protected. And that protection, if you, just like in a, in a good family, in a good family, the parents protect the children. And what does that do? When the child grows up in an environment where they were protected, they feel secure. It crystallizes their sense of security and that security makes that particular child confident in their dealings in the world. So there's a natural connection between potion and protection and security and confidence. So sixth canto is potion. Seventh canto is Utaya, uh, Uti, actually, sometimes it's said Uti, which is to do with the, um, actually, I'll, I'll come back to that because I had some notes on that, but I'll have <laughs> to on. Anyway, I'll go to eighth canto, Manvanta. Eighth canto, in the eighth canto, we hear um, the story of Bali Maharaj, for example. In the eighth canto, it talks about the different Manus, uh, who are the different rulers. And it is also explained that the 
the different manus, they are engaging in sad dharma. There's two, there's two levels of dharma. One is worldly dharma, but there's also an eternal dharma. So when the, when the great rulers, when the manus run the world, run the creation, what are they doing? They are establishing dharmic rulership and they are then making sure that everyone is engaged in their proper occupation and the eternal occupation, the sad dharma, the um, sanatana dharma of every living entity is to do what? Jivaras Rupaya Krishna and Nitya Das. Sad dharma means engaging in Krishna consciousness. Right? So that is the subject matter of the eighth canto, which is to do with Manvanta. Canto nine, Ishanukata, which is to do with, um, so Ishanukata means the pastimes of the Lord, actually. So it says the science of God, it also means the pastimes of the Lord. So the entire Bhagavatam as a whole is, is, doing, is dealing with what? The glorification of the Lord and his devotees. So ninth canto deals with this Ishanukata. Now then it takes a slightly different order. The 10th canto deals with the Sanan Bona. So in the 10th canto, we have Krishna specifically and his, in, his, in, um, his leelas in Vrindavan, so Vraj Leela. So the 10th canto is really introducing us specifically, not just different incarnations of the Lord, because throughout the other cantos, we hear about different incarnations. But 10th canto has a specific focus on Krishna and his pastimes of his devotees. So Ashraya. Uh, ashraya also means the shelter, supreme shelter. So that's 10th canto. 11th canto is Niroda. Uh, that, so here it says, going back home, back to Godhead, it also means the dissolution, the winding down of creation. And 12th canto is Mukti, liberation. So why do we share this and why is this such an interesting framework to understand? It's because as we want to study the scripture, you can also see that each particular canto can be considered according to this, um, according to this particular framework, uh, Krama theory by Vishwanath Chakravali Thakur. We can also consider that each canto has a particular theme and a particular understanding that it is trying to bring across to us as living entities. And so it's very, very interesting to study the Bhagavatam or actually even to study scripture generally from this perspective, that nothing is accidental and that the entire teachings, each canto has a particular overarching theme. And when we understand that, we can see everything else through the lens of that particular, let's say, a framework. Uh, when we do this, one of the benefits is that we can see all the different pastimes and activities going on, and we can, again, link it back to a particular, um, yeah, to a particular topic in that, in that particular sense. So these are just some thoughts on the idea that the scripture itself carries certain categories or certain, yeah, categories or structures around it that you can use to hang, that you can use to hang certain understandings to. I'm just going to ask if we can be muted. Okay. So, yeah, so this is the idea that within the, the teachings, and, and there's many different frameworks. This is just one. This is the 10 topics, which are throughout the Bhagavatam. Another way that we sometimes understand the scriptures is through the modes. We know that there are 18 Puranas. There are six for those in the mode of ignorance, six Puranas for those in the mode of passion. We know that there are six Puranas in the mode of goodness as well. So there are different ways in which we can categorize the scripture. And there's a term called Shastra Yukti. And what this means is that when we, when we study the teachings and we try to understand where everything fits, what fits with what. So, okay, this topic fits in this way with this topic. Then what it does is it also helps us to, to become more, uh, let's see, clear in our understanding of the teachings. 
it helps us to almost like put the teachings together like a jigsaw puzzle. Now, of course, when no one's expecting us to do this over t um, like immediately, it's something that we just start to pick up. And, and I'll just give you one example before we open the questions. So I was reflecting on this point and I heard this point in a class about the third canto of Bhagavatam. And so in the third canto of Bhagavatam, we, we see a very interesting contrast between two couples. And I was just thinking about, about the class that Marge gave recently, third canto, chapter 24, text number 15. And Marge was giving the class on the verse, and John Mooney Marge was giving the class on the verse and on the purple. So in that same third canto, Bhagavatam, we see an, an amazing contrast. So the contrast is between two couples. You have Diti and Kasyapa Muni. So that's one contrast. What happens in their union? Okay, so Diti, she actually, Diti actually seduces her husband. So she wants to have union. He tells her this is not the right time, but she decides that still she would like to have that union. And he, he gives in. And so because, so in the Bhagavatam, it explains that the, the son will have the mentality of the mother and the daughter will have the mentality of the father. Uh, so when Diti um, seduces her husband, Kasyapa Muni, and they have union, but at the wrong time, at the time which is inauspicious, then she has come to him for union, but with a very strong enjoying mood. Now, of course, he's also given in, but because she has that enjoying mood, the son that's born of that union between Diti and Kasyapa Muni is Hiran Yaksha. Uh, Hiran Yaksha, the name means golden eyes. <laughs> it, means, it means one who sees gold, you know, one who's looking for that gold all the time. It is at, he is the personification of greed. So through that desire to just enjoy, they give birth to a son who's the personification of greed, who's actually a demon in that sense. So that's one, um, one example in the third canto. And that contrasts very, very strongly with another couple in the third canto. Kardama Muni and Devahuti. So Kardama Muni is a sage. Devahuti is the daughter of a great, um, you know, leader, king. Right? So I am Bhuvamanu. And she is betrothed or she's given to Kardama Muni. And what happens there? She serves in a very, very humble and sincere way. And because of that, Kardama Muni he has this mystic ability. He can, he, can, he can manifest certain things. So he manifests this great palace, flying palace. And through their union, she gives birth to, uh, let's see, I keep forgetting the name of the, um, she gives birth to an incarnation of God. Remind me, the name of the, of the, of the, Child who's born of Kapila Prabhupada. Exactly. Thank you. Kapila Muni, okay. who's actually an incarnation of the Lord himself. Right? Kapila Dev. So you could see here a very, very strong co contrast between the approaches of the couples, especially the ladies in terms of the husband, and also the child that is born of that particular union as well. And I'm just sharing this because as you go through the Bhagavatam, as we go deeper and deeper into the Bhagavatam, more and more we will see these amazing parallels, these amazing contrasts between different personalities, different characters. And it's very deliberate because the Bhagavatam, through the pages of the Bhagavatam, through the pages of the Bhagavatam, we're able to see different types of human behavior, different types of interaction, and the long-term outcomes of those different behaviors and interactions. It, it is literally an encyclopedia of the human condition. 
It is explaining different personality types, how they behave and what happened to them as a result of such behavior. And as we deeply go into hearing about, reflecting on these pastimes within the Bhagavatam, they become literally and different examples of how to respond in all the different ta- in all the different types of human conditions or human situations that we may find ourselves in. How we can respond such that we can mold our life in such a way that we can progress on the journey of coming closer to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. So we really want to share some of these considerations just to throw this out as a beginning um, for some conversational discussion. I know we have about uh, just under 20 minutes. So I thought we'd stop there and just see if you have any questions based upon any of the points we shared so far. Hare Krishna, thank you Prabhuji uh, for the nice class. Uh, Can you just little elaborate on seventh canto? I think you just... uh thought that you'll come back on it again oh. yes so yes yeah, so let's, let's go back to the if you could put the um verse again yeah the verse again yes please so saga visaga stanam potionam uti so in the seventh canto yeah it says the creative impetus in this actually let me just see if i can get my notes up actually because i had some <laughs> I had some notes that I've been making on an overview of the Bhagavatam. So if I can bring some of my notes up, we may be able to just give a little bit more uh, detail to that. So bear with me one second. Just. Uh, you want to share it um, on the on your computer, Prabhuji? Or no, no, my my notes are on my phone. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just. Uh, bring this up. So we. This name. Here we are. Okay, so Bhagavatam notes. Some topics. Overview. Let me one second. I'm just scrolling through <laughs> to find my notes. Yeah, sorry, actually. So the first canto is Adhikari Tattva. I think I may have used the wrong term, but the first canto is Adhikari Tattva, which is that methodology about how we can actually get the best or get the real benefit from the Bhagavatam. So that's, that's one point. And then let's just find specifics. Okay. I hear them. Okay. I'm going to have to come back on that because I have to find my specific notes on that on that seventh canto. But yeah, as I said, the karma theory really relates to all of these partic- um, to this particular area, to uti, which is the creative impetus. In the seventh canto, we do hear about the story of Prahlad Maharaj, and in the seventh canto, we see. In Prahlad Maharaj's example, what it means to be a pure, unalloyed devotee of the Lord, who is, um, whose only motive, that's it, because uti can also mean impetus to act, that was it. So we see how his only motive was to actually um, engage in pure devotional service in the limbs of bhakti, and his motive or impetus to act was so strong that even in the face of various opportunities or various, let's say, no opportunities, various attempts by his father to kill him, actually, he was able to maintain his devotion to the Lord. <clears throat> and ultimately, at a particular point, the Lord himself in the form of Nishingadev 
came to give direct protection to Prahlad Maharaj. So we, we know the pastime that eventually his father will say, is your Lord in this pillar? And Prahlad Maharaj says, yes, actually. And then Hiranya Kashipu smashes the pillar and, and Lord Nishingadev appears and he kills Hiranya Kashipu. And he kills him actually in such a way that he maintains the boon that Hiranya Kashipu had been given by Lord Brahma. He will not be killed on, you know, well, he would not be killed by an animal or a human um, in the daytime or the nighttime on the land, except he gives so many different things. But um, yeah, this, this sense of impetus or the, the motivation to act, you could say, this is in one sense displayed very powerful by, powerfully by Prahlad Maharaj because his motivation to serve under all circumstances is absolutely unbreakable. So we could say in that sense, it relates to that. Okay, Uti. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you for thank that. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, devotees, if you have any questions or comments or realizations, please go ahead. Are there any questions or comments that anyone has? Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhuji, um, thank you so much for your class. Um, you. When we're reading Bhagavatam and the topics that you mentioned, I don't necessarily connect to those topics while I'm reading them. Is it something that you have to be conscious of or, or does it happen automatically? Um, it tends not to happen automatically and you don't have to necessarily correlate. I'm just pointing out that Vishnath Chakravali Thakur he does, actually, he does actually connect the different topics of the Bhagavatam to different cantos. At the same time, it is explained that every canto has all the different topics, but what Vishnav Chakravali Thakur is doing is pointing out that there may be a particular prominence of a particular theme of the Bhagavatam to a particular canto of the Bhagavatam. So it's not something you need to worry about. I just thought it would be interesting to share. And, and the reason why I found it useful is because then when I was reading the particular canto, I could understand more about how some of the different things in the canto relate to a particular theme of the Bhagavatam. That was all. That was all. So it's, the, the underlying point is that when, when we go to learn something, it's often easy to learn something if you've got something to hang it on to, right? So, so think of your mind, think of your mind like a, like a house, okay? So in the house, you have different places. You have a kitchen, you have a living room, you have a bedroom, you have a bathroom. So when you're moving house, let's say you have a box. And then in the box, you can see that there are, uh, there are kitchen appliances, there's a blender, uh, there's a microwave. You know, okay, that stuff belongs in the kitchen, right? So you know that you can relate these items, you know immediately where to put it, yeah? So in the same way, sometimes by understanding the 10 topics of the Bhagavatam, when you read different things, you know, oh, okay, this all relates to this particular theme, just like the themes like a, like a room and all the different things that you're reading um, are like the items, yeah? Otherwise, sometimes people read the Bhagavatam and there's so much there, right? You're hearing about this devotee, that devotee, you know, this incarnation, that incarnation, and you think, oh, wow, this, this, there's a lot here. So one of the reasons why I found this to be useful is because when we read a certain canto, we can think of it in relation to a certain theme, if we wish to, right? But you don't, but you're not tied to it. So it was just thought it'd be an interesting thing to share. Yeah. Yes, that does make sense. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying. Okay, no worries. So I saw a question by Kushbu. Can I, is it okay for to answer that question? Yes, yes perfect. yeah. Okay, so Hare Krishna, can you please suggest some tips on how to read the Bhagavatam? I've read it once, but wanted to reread it, but go deeper. Yeah, there's, there's so many ways in which we can study the Bhagavatam. So sometimes it's suggested that at first, if you want to get, you may want to just get an overview of a particular canto. 
So what some devotees do in, as, as they're studying, let's say they want to study the first canto, they may begin by just reading the verses. And by reading the verses, they know roughly what's happening in the actual Bhagavatam, like um, first canto itself in terms of the narrative, right? So they know, okay, so they just read all the verses and they can hear, okay, there's a conversation going on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then having done that, then they'll read it again, but this time they'll read the verses and the purple. So they know what the narrative is. And now what they're hearing as they read is Prabhupada elaborating and expanding on these particular verses. So when you read the verses, you have the text. When you read the verses with Prabhupada's purples, you have the text plus the context, right? So you know what's going on and, you, and Prabhupada is giving also what we call the subtext. He's giving the meaning behind each of these particular verses. And then also, I found it can be very powerful to study the Bhagavatam with a friend, right? Because it's such a big text that when you study it with friends, then you start to really, you start to really start to get into the, um, what's the word? You start to get into the different angles of vision. I was, um, I shared with some devotees today, there was um, a podcast, Chaitanya Charan, it's called the Monk Podcast. And it's a conversation between Chaitanya Charan, Krishna Dharma, and his wife Chintamani. And it's on, it's on the topic of studying the Shastra from different angles of vision. And I thought it was incredible. To be honest with you, it's incredibly interesting conversation and discussion. And so what they're really talking about is that when we study the Bhagavatam in association of devotees, we'll read a verse in purple, and then we can ask each other, what stood out for you? You see? And so one person will say, yeah, I, I, I saw this it was really interesting. And what stood out for me was that Prabhupada was saying this. And someone else will say, yeah, I thought what was very interesting in the purple by Prabhupada or in the verse is that this is coming out. And it reminds me of this other point. So when you study the Bhagavatam like that in discussion, you're reading the verse, you're reading the purple, and then you're discussing with other devotees what stood out for you, why, how it relates to other things that you've read and heard. It can be an incredibly satisfying and moreover a transformative experience as well. So Kushbu, that's that's one way um, you can study. Um, another way you can study is you can look at a particular topic, right? So let's say I want to understand more about the mind. And so I'm read I've read the Bhagavatam and now I'm gonna read the perp, I'm gonna look at sorry, the um, the index. And look, and what is, where, where are the references in this canto about the mind, right? Uh, someone else may think, I, I want to, you know, I'm going to study Bhagavatam. So I want to look at what Prabhupada is about chanting, Hare Krishna mantra. So they're looking at the Bhagavatam, but from the point of view of, an, of, an, of a specific subject matter that they want to study more about, that could be another way of studying. So there's a few different ways, right? Another way is that you... Um, you read, you read the verse, you read the purple, and you make notes on different things that stood out to you. Some people even study the Bhagavatam based upon particular issues that they're facing in their life, and they want to understand more. What does Prabhupada say about that? Of course, that should be done after you've actually read it sequentially. So we don't jump, jump to a thematic study. We first make sure we read the entire thing um, systematically in its sequential order, but there's also these other angles at which you can look into the Bhagavatam. I also find, and um, there's an overview of the Bhagavatam by Sutapa. That can be very, very useful because when, and there's also one by the, um, there's one called Bhagavat Subodhini. So you may, and, and then there's also the um, unveiling his lotus feet, the Bhagavatam overview by um, Burijan Prabhu. So another way to study the Bhagavatam is to read an overview first. Let's say you want to study the first canto. So you've read it already, which is good. So you should read the whole thing through, the whole Bhagavatam. But then you may think, okay, let me look at the overview of the first canto. So I read that first, and then I go through the first canto again, connected to the overview of it, because then it will bring out more and more of the detail and the connections between the different things. And you can do it with someone that you that you, you know, 
a friend, another devotee, and it can be, I tell you honestly, it can be incredibly relishable. It's so incredible because the Bhagavatam, every time you, you study the Bhagavatam, you're in direct contact with Krishna. And, and what transforms us and changes us is the contact with Krishna in the form of his holy name, in the form of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the more we do it, the more sincerely we do it, the more attentively we do it, the more we become purified. So, yeah, those, those are some ideas. Yeah. Thank you for your question, Kushpu. Um, maybe we have time for one last question before I, I will need to leave for another appointment. Sudha so, Mataji. So, oh, Oh, sorry, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Um, Hare Krishna, Dhanu Pranam, uh, Prabhuji. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, sorry, all glories to... Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Guru Maharaj. Thank you for the very nice class. Um, thank you, Prabhuji. This really helps me so much. Understanding like, uh, you know, 10 topics is very important. Uh, because I read, I feel like it's more mechanical, but uh, today's uh, your, um, this uh, lecture, it really helped me to how to actually uh, read and how to see Bhagavatam. Um, so, um, so Prabhuji, like I have a question about like, you know, uh, I really like, you know, see day to day we face so many challenges mm -hmm. and want to really apply i mean apply the krishna consciousness when we actually go through those challenges and uh, i like the contrast which you gave like dehahuti and uh, kadamba muni and uh, those things how like sense gratification is so dangerous and uh, that leads to a problem so Prabhuji, i have a question like yesterday's class like uh, like you mentioned like you know Sometimes like, you know, we are just working for paying bills to maintain roof on the top mm -hmm. and trying to practice Krishna consciousness. But uh, when we actually have these kind of disturbances, it's very hard um, to actually focus on Krishna consciousness and follow and do our devotional service. Uh, I mean, scenarios like this, I mean, we come across uh, daily. Um, so could you please explain like how we can relate this kind of situations like you know in the Bhagavatam and uh, apply those yes. yeah yeah the Bhagavatam is full of those situations of challenges I mean let's <laughs> let's think about this you have you have the Pandavas right the Pandavas are mentioned in, in the Bhagavatam you have they they have the, all the intrigues that they face so many attempts to kill them you know by Duryodhan by the Kauravas and then it ultimately tends, it turns into a war, et cetera, like the Battle of Cook, et cetera. So they have challenges. You have the challenges that we see, as we mentioned with um, Prahlad Maharaj, demoniac father, so many attempts by his demoniac father to kill him. We have the pastime of Bali Maharaj. He's actually tricked. <laughs> He's tricked by Vamanadev. You know, Vamanadev actually, he, he takes all, he three steps, he takes everything. You know, and but, but what's also interesting is before Varman and Dave tricks Bali Maharaj, you have the battle between the demons and the devas, right? The demigods, and the demigods are losing. So Indra's losing, and Indra's wants to know, and they they want to understand why, how is it that this this Bali Maharaj is so powerful? And it's explained that he this is in the eighth canto, chapter fifteen, text number twenty eight, that because Bali Maharaj has, has been blessed by the descendants of Brigu, right? The Brahmana descendants of Brigu, therefore he becomes so powerful. And in the purple, Prabhupada says that it's the mercy of the spiritual master that gives, that makes one advance basically. And that mercy is more important than one's own endeavor to make advancement. So the key point we should understand is that we all have our battle of Kurukshetra. Mm -hmm. as, as people trying to make um, advancement, we will all have different challenges. But if we read and study the Bhagavatam, what we're really reading and studying is how many different devotees through different challenging situations were able to become victorious. And if we remember that, then we, and we remember their example, even their example will give us inspiration that Krishna will always protect his devotee. Huh? Mm -hmm. Krishna says that in um, Bhagavad Gita, 
Arjuna declare it boldly that my devotee shall never perish. Uh, and then on top of that, to make it applicable to our present day situation, through the, through the discussions with devotees, we can look at these pastimes and think, what am I meant to learn? How do I apply this understanding? For example, we see when Maharaj Pariksit is cursed to die, what does he do? He goes towards the, the, the association of Shukadev Goswami and he says, what is a person meant to do is when he's about to die? Uh, so the inquiry process is reinforced through the example, through the pastimes. What we're meant to do in situations of difficulty is submissively inquire from the devotees in order to get the advice that we need to be successful. And we see this also is, is mentioned in a different way in the nectar of instruction. Six loving exchanges include revealing the mind mm -hmm. and inquiring confidentially about Krishna. That means inquiring confidentially that given our circumstances, how can I continue to make progress to achieve the goal of Krishna consciousness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you, Prabhuji. So situations like that, uh, because uh, I mean, I'm very neophyte, usually, uh, uh, definitely if you read, they are very self-realized souls. But uh, uh, but as you said, like uh, when we come across these situations, we have to inquire submissively and um, um, try to apply it. Mm -hmm. Yes, in our own lives, yes inquiry mm -hmm. look we can also study the scriptures to see how did great devotees deal with different challenges mm -hmm. and we see for example they kept equipoise they didn't sound like losing their temper and anger and frustration they were very equipoise they took okay. shelter of other devotees right we mm -hmm. see that also they inquired from other devotees to get advice on how to navigate challenges once i'll end on this point because i'm gonna have to go but one of the things that maya tries to make us do is to make our mind our guru. So what Maya tries to do when people have difficulty, they rather than consulting with Guru Sadhu Shastra, they just do whatever their mind says. <laughs> now, if your mind is pure like Prabhupada, that's fine. If the mind is backed up by pure scripture, that's fine. But if the mind is still conditioned, we should also not necessarily just take the mind's dictation as correct. We should make sure that the mind is, is is in line with what we're hearing from our teachers, from Guru Sadhu Shastra, in order to make sure that we can progress properly. Yeah? Oh. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. thank you so much. Definitely mind <laughs> takes over most of the time. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so forgive me, but I'll have to stop now. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you thank so much, Prabhuji. Thank you so much for the wonderful class okay. and wonderful question answer session. Um, we look forward to your uh, association one more time, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. Once I call for the request, I can pass on the message of the time. I'm having a few hours to be beyond the moment. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, devotees, for joining. Um, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Raj Ki Jai. Thank you. It was very nice. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you very much.